Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for spending some time this afternoon. And I, I hope it's to hear the content rather than just to rest your weary feet. Although I suspect the amount of stands out there that now have got their own baristas and coffee machines, you're probably all whizzing a little bit as well. Um, anyway, without further ado, you might have noticed if you'd seen the original agenda, there's actually been a slight change to the agenda in that we've got someone different to, rather than on by, but Sarah, would you yes. like to say who you are and where you're from? Yes, I am not Kath. Um, I am Sarah Wallace. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Minted, um, which is a US-based um, company. And we sell personalized, primarily stationery and artwork. We have a very large set of um, artists and designers. We don't, um, who are all independent artists and designers who create the designs and the artwork that we then um, produce and manufacture on demand for our customers. Um, we don't do any design and art um, in-house. It's all through these independent um, artists and designers. And we have our community will vote on which of their designs um, they'd like to see uh, put into production. And I am, um, as I mentioned, I'm chief operating officer. So I'm responsible for all of the kind of the back end pieces of that, um, customer service, uh, supply chain, legal, IT, design operations, um, as well as our strategic operations organization. Um, and then a, going back um, a little bit more, I have been with a number of brands in uh, general manager and head of e-com roles. So I'm very familiar with um, and have even run marketing, digital marketing as well. So I've worked for brands like Bear Essentials, Indochino, Lululemon, Aviva, Athleta, Gap, and then um, Walmart as well as the, the largest. So going back to Minty, do you see yourselves as a technology platform, or do you see yourself as a merchant, or are you a bit of a, a hybrid? Yes. <laughs> um, we see ourselves as both. I mean, I think um, we see ourselves as a technology company. We do not have retail stores, and nor do we have inventory. All of our inventory is is in is work in prog um, is uh, raw materials, waiting for a customer to place an order. Um, at which point we manufacture the order for them. So, getting into the weeds a little bit, you receive an order. That goes. Does that go to the designer to create? or are you producing it through your own technology and then you distribute mm -hmm. onwards to the customer? Good, good question. Um, we, before we launch a new season, so for example, we've just launched our holiday cards uh, designs. And what we did earlier this year was we ran a design challenge where all of our designers, independent artists and designers could submit um, their designs to our challenge. We have a community um, that is comprised of our artists, our designers, our employees, our customers, who will all indicate whether they like something or whether it's not to their taste. We take that information um, and have a very um, powerful algorithm that helps us understand that, for example, when you like something, it's going to be very popular. When I like something, it actually means it's passe. Um, and when uh, you vote on something, it's trending. And so it's not going to be big this year, but it's going to be big in two years. So we then t decide um, our merchandise assortment based on the results of, of that um, design challenge. And we create an assortment that's online. Then as a customer, you come in and you want to do your holiday card. And you look at all of the hundreds of options that we have, which is the base design, the outlines, whether it's a full bleed photo or not, whether it uses foil or whether it's digital printing. And you say, OK, I like that design. And you put your photography and your verbiage. You can change the text and the font. So you customize it to make it your own. That's when the order gets, that's when you place your order. At that point, we turn it into um, a digital file, which we then send to our printer, and our printers produce it um, on demand. Going a step back to your cohort of designers, mm. is that group really flexible? And you can see the algorithm says, actually, your choices are trending for next year. Yep. 
so actually, as a designer, you're not really a good fit for this year, therefore we're not going to use you? Or do you just have a huge database of designers and actually the algorithm then picks them up at the appropriate point? No, it, it would be by challenge um, and it's up to designers to submit their, um, their designs for each challenge. We do have designers who um, are watching the trends and if they think that the reason they weren't picked up this year was because they're early, they'll submit it again for the next year's design challenge. Okay, so we've got to the nuts and bolts of what Minted is about. Yeah. Let's start talking a little bit around how you scale that. So you've started off as a relatively small idea. How do you move it forward? When we were talking earlier, we were talking about the growing pains of a business. What have you been experiencing as a business? What are the challenges that you've been facing as you've been getting more and more popular? Yeah, well, I mean, this stage of company, I, I mentioned earlier, I, I call it the awkward teenage years. Um, and I've been through it with a few different organizations. And there's a couple of things that I've seen over and over and over again as you scale a business. Um, the first one, I think, is um, putting in place processes to help with um, communication and um, make sure that there's alignment around where the organization is going and what the priorities are. A very small organization um, is wonderful because you just, everybody knows what needs to be done and you think of a good idea and you just say, yes, great, go, go do it. Um, and everyone by osmosis has the information they need to, um, to do a good job and do what needs to be done. As a company grows and there are more and more folks with individual areas of responsibility, um, the blast radius of any sort of um, impact decision gets larger. And so making sure that you've communicated to the right people um, what information needs to be communicated to make those good decisions becomes a little bit more of a challenge. It's not everyone sitting in a room together knowing what needs to be known. So you, you, you stepping away from that slightly, and you going back to really that customer expectation, because that's where the growth has come from, is being yeah. able to meet those customer expectations. How do you help customers? Product discovery is one element of it, but also curate the selection that is then presented towards that company. You talked about the challenges. How early on does that challenge take place in your business cycle, and how regularly do you do it? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the first step is that design challenge and coming up with a good merchandise assortment. So although we don't have in-house designers, we do have in-house merchants who will take the results of the design challenges and create a wonderful assortment using that algorithm as signals. Um, in terms of curation, we have a lot of things that we do to help customers find um, the style that's right for them. So the first is that, you know, very standard, we have filters. Um, so if customers can choose their style, they can choose the size, they can choose um, the rounded edges or um, straight edges. But then we also have things that we've done leveraging technology. So for example, we have text us your photo. And um, if you text us your photo, we'll come up with 10 cards that we think match the color, style, et cetera, of your photo and say, hey, we think that these 10 holiday cards would be good for you. Um, the other thing that we do is we have text us your wall. So we also do art. And so um, we have art stylists who can receive a text picture of your wall and say, you know, provide back five to 10 options of art, artwork that we think would work and what size. And that can be everything from just one singular um, picture or piece of art, or you can say, here's my entire room. I want you to just decorate it. And our art stylists can pull, will pull together different sizes, things that go together um, uh, and coordinate with one another. That sounds like a very manual process. Is there a role for AI to drop into that and start helping ease some of that load? Yeah, well, so I think the, the first one, which is text us your photo, um, and we provide um, the holiday card suggestions with your picture already in situ so you can see what it would look like, that is already fully automated. Um, I do think that there are some opportunities for AI to help with um, 
the some of the styling and concierge and assisted services that we do. I, again, I think um, you know I I was in a session earlier this morning and I encouraged everyone to to understand that when you look at data, data is fundamentally backwards looking, and we need humans to think about the future and to look around the corners. And I think there's something similar here with styling and AI, which is that we could certainly leverage AI to help make some suggestions. But fundamentally, taste and style um, right now also requires the overlay of a person. So we, we are looking at AI as something that can help make our people more effective and more efficient, but not replace them. So you, the design element is still very much a human interaction almost about emotion and feeling, and we're not quite yet there with, um, with AI on that. Yeah. Thankfully, I think. Yeah. Um, how, how do you, how do you f see yourself competing against other players in the marketplace? Is it, is it that, that customer retention piece? Is it around that constant evolution of the product that you're offering? Or do you think that design challenge is giving you that edge? Do you think that's where you're getting some differentiation? Yeah, the, I mean, I think there's two points of differentiation we have. The first is that artist and design community. Many of our competitors will have in-house designers, um, or they'll they have a hybrid of in-house as well as going outside to a community. So the fact that we have this completely independent <clears throat> community, as well as this incredibly powerful algorithm that helps us identify what will work and what won't work. Um, <clears throat> that's a big differentiator when it comes to our product assortment. The other thing is that we are very high end. We have extremely high um, quality standards. So for example, our foil, um, so when you see something shiny on your card, um, there is now a process called digital foil where you can basically just print it. We don't do that because it doesn't have the same feel to it. We still use the pressed foil okay. process which is much more challenging. Um, but it has a different look and feel to it. So we also think that that's one of our differentiators is that we work with very high-end printers. So we originally started out talking about scalability and being able to manage when you know, the, the demand goes through the roof, you weren't expecting it, how do you build on it? The process that you've talked about just there doesn't sound very scalable either. How do you, we've already talked a little bit about having the, the teams in place to help you with that growth, how do you then look at the rest of the organization in terms of, of technology and investment to be able to cope with some of that, that change? And how do you cope with some of the unexpected growth peaks that you often get in business? Yeah, well, so one of our biggest businesses is our holiday card business. So that means that we have a very big peak. But that's predictable. You know when that's going to happen. <coughs> we do, it is predictable, yes. Um, and we have a wedding business, an art business, kids and baby that sort of balance out the rest of the year. So there's a couple of things we do. The first is that we spend a lot of time thinking about um, how to fill the other, the other 11 months of the year um, to make sure that we have a much more even business if we can. And then we do leverage a lot of technology to help us scale during those periods um, where we where we do have our peak sales period. Before we move on, because I've got lots of questions I could keep on going. Has anyone got any questions for Sarah? Any questions? No questions. I'll leave it to me okay. then. That's fine. Um, <laughs> again, looking at that, that growth phase, how easy has it been to manage the expectations of your, your business partners, the investors, the, you know, the, the, the shareholders of the organization, because um, obviously everyone wants it to grow, and if it grows 150% you know, last year, where's that going to come from next year? How easy is it to manage, do you think, as a, as a business, that those expectations with what you could physically achieve? Yeah, I mean, I, one of the, so I'm, I'm based in San Francisco, and um, th so there's a lot of startups, a lot of technology, a lot of growth businesses, and then also a lot of very large businesses. And, um, you know, in the spirit of, of never let a, a crisis go to waste, um, one of the things that has happened 
as I'm sure most of you know, is that it has been a very different market for raising money. And I think one of the wonderful things about that is that you know you can you can chase growth and continue to look for investment in order to fund that growth, or you can self-fund growth by becoming profitable. And I think it's a really cool um, transition to make that if you can look and deliver EBITDA and profitability that funds gr your own growth, you have so much more control over your destiny. And a lot of companies in sort of in my world that I um, that I live in are now looking at a period of time where they you know money was pretty easy to come by, so it was all about growth. And now it's a much more balanced view, and I think that's a really interesting dynamic and very fun. Certainly, as the the head of operations, a lot of the um, the need for profitability lands on my shoulders, and it's really fun to look for those opportunities to bring automation technology scale economies, um, other business opportunities to bear for the organization to, to deliver that profitability that helps fund our next stage of growth. So I've been involved in e-com for just over 20 odd years now. And I can remember, if we look back 10, 15 years, it was triple digit growth year in, year out. You pretty much just had to put a website up and it worked. Um, and effectively, we've seen investment in the sector go through those peaks and troughs as well. Do you think it's overall, it's healthy for us to go back to those business principles? You're talking about you know, growth within profitability. That's good business, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it is a good business. It is, yeah, it's a pretty fundamental business model. But at the same time, does it also restrict you with the opportunities that you spot? Um, I don't think so, because I, I think that as a business grows, um, focus and prioritization become ever more important. Um, so during my time at Walmart, no one ever told me this, but I started to realize and pick up on a pattern, um, which is that they're very intentional about three. Basically, humans can think about and manage and focus on three things. And so I've started to incorporate that Whenever I go through a business strategy or a business review, I'm always focused on what are the three things that we need to focus on. Whenever I'm in a meeting, I think what are the three things that I need folks to decide on, I need them to take away. Um, and I think it is really important when you're leading organizations with lots of people or even just a few handfuls of people to be able to provide focus and prioritization um, so that everybody knows you're headed in the right direction. Now, how that manifests, you know, my legal team, my IT team, and my supply chain team may manifest a, um, pro a profitability initiative differently, but at least we're all, we all know that what is our number one focus? It's profitability in order to then feed back into growth. The other thing is that, as a, um, I mentioned before, you know, that as smaller organizations, you can sort of say like, hey, you've got a great idea, run with it, go do it. When you're a larger organization and trying to fund growth, once you're at the sort of 100, 200 million dollar mark, million dollar ideas, while they may be really good, cool ideas that would work, aren't going to drive the growth that you need. So you need to be thinking about what are the 10, 20, 50 million ideas that I'm going to need to be implementing and running against and testing and trying in order to really drive the growth of the company to the next stage. Which brings us back to that profitability element. And if we're wanting to be profitable, we need to think about our customers. Yeah. And it's more profitable to service an existing customer than find a new customer. So what's Minted doing to try and increase the, 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 the purchase patterns, you know, the propensity to purchase, how often they purchase? I, I don't like lifetime value for a cust as, as, a, as a term, but you know, how are we trying to get more out of that relationship? Well, so from, from my vantage point, um, running operations, I've, I have a very simple mantra um, that we are all running at. Get it right the first time. Um, get the customer the product that they ordered and they want in good quality when we said we we're going to get it to them. So you can see you start to sort of ratchet down, like, okay, get it right the first time, because if they have a good experience, we have phenomenal product. It's all personalized. It's beautiful. It, people are proud to use minted product, to have art, minted art on their walls, to send out minted holiday cards and invitations. 
So if we can deliver to them a good experience, they will come back. Um, so, excuse me. <laughs> so sorry Actually. about that. I think it's like five in the morning for me still. Um, so um, we're very focused on, from my vantage, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at customer acquisition or customer retention. It doesn't matter how good your loyalty program is. It doesn't matter how good your marketing campaigns are. If a customer doesn't have a good experience when they actually come to purchase, it's going to be extremely hard to retain them. Um, so I spend a lot of my time focused on quality initiatives. And do you think the... <coughs> I, I, I can remember when people like Netta Porter first launched online, everyone said you couldn't do luxury online. And actually what they said was actually it's about the, that experience when you receive that box through the post and it's opening the box and you get the experience of the brand come through and then obviously the product. And actually they found that people were then, especially if it was delivered to the office, then going and opening the box again in front of other people to so, you know, sh show off effectively. Mm -hmm. How important is that fulfillment element in your customer journey? Well, I think um, it's important if you assume that sort of a baseline dial tone non-negotiable is that the product arrives um, in pristine condition. So for example, I would love to give a sort of unveiling moment with our artwork. But fundamentally, if I'm shipping a four foot by five foot painting that is has glass and has a wooden frame, that's secondary to making sure that it gets there in one piece, no damage, because really, basically, that's, that's the moment, right, to see the artwork. And then we layer in some of the other elements of, um, of um, the experience of opening. And do you ha how, this is probably slightly off topic, but how do you think your customers engage through social channels with you as a brand? So yes, it comes in a, gr a great big box. Yeah. You know, it's not gonna look pretty at that point. I hang it on the wall, I step back. Are you doing anything to try and capture that moment in social and try and use that to drive you know, engagement? We do. Um, so I think, so first of all, I mean, we, our boxes are very pretty. Um, so we actually don't send in just a plain corrugate um, box. We actually have it minted. So you sort of know and you're like, oh, I'm, my minted box is here. My artwork is here. Um, and then, yeah, we do have a lot of, um, of campaigns. We work with a number of influencers um, who, are design who are getting married, who are um, designing their homes, and um, we capture a lot of content that we share that way. Okay. And again, we're coming, bringing that back to so like the, the technology and the scalability. Is that more bums on seats doing that sort of role, or are you trying to automate some of that process? Um, with the social media yeah. side? Um, right now, it's more bums in seats because we want to make sure that the content that is created and is shared is appropriate for our um, sort of higher end brand positioning. Okay. If we go back to the technology piece again, and it seems to me, I'm not involved in that side of the industry at all, but it seems to me to be fairly bespoke. Mm -hmm. How do you, again, the scalability question, you know, how scalable is it? Are there limitations? And, and then how do you restrict where your artists might take you or where those challenges might take you? Yeah, I mean, fundamentally we have built, and this is par partly comes back to the competition side of things, which is that we've built the ability to efficiently produce these bespoke products. Um, we have the technology to automate a lot of the delivery of the files. Um, we've worked very closely with the printers to be able to efficiently um, manufacture on demand. It is certainly a challenge um, during our very peak periods to scale, but throughout the rest of the year, um, it really is 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 fairly straightforward. Um, so what you've described so far is, you know, you touched on right at the beginning, it's a technology platform, you've got some designers that are, are providing the inspiration to the customer. Do you see yourselves as 
a disruptor in the marketplace or do you think you've created a new marketplace? I think both. Um, you know, when, when Mariam Nafisi, who is our founder, founded the company 13 years ago, it was a completely different idea. Um, this idea of sort of working exclusively with independent artists and designers. At this point now, you know, the things have caught up and there is more ability to create bespoke um, product. But our belief in and support of our designer community is a really critical aspect of what we do. Um, and that continues to be a differentiator for us. Um, we work with designers and artists throughout the world. Um, and so ranging from you know, parents who will do a little bit in the evening after the kids go to bed for a little bit of pocket money to um, folks who are using you know, we have a, a woman who is um, a plumber in New York, and she uses her art and design as a creative outlet for herself after work. And she's like, well, I might as well, you know, earn a little money as well. And then we also have artists who are, um, they work full time and spend all of their time. They are artists, and they are able to make a living through what they earn from Minted. So that's giving the brand some personality. So you're moving away from it being a technology yeah. brand to a personality and um, not necessarily innovation, but it's, it's certainly got a life of its own to a degree because you've got lots of individuals producing, producing the art. How confident are you that that pool of creativity is always going to be enough for you? Oh, I mean, there's, there's no end to creativity. Um, and I, I mean, we're always looking to bring more artists with more perspectives, um, more styles, more technical skills um, to continue to bring um, new designs to the forefront. And to your, your question earlier about curation and discovery, um, you know, as we get better and better, at understanding customer information, we can bring more and more designs on the site. Obviously, so when I worked at Walmart, I was leading the women's fashion world, and I had millions and millions of SKUs um, between our first party and our third party products. And so discovery was an incredibly challenging aspect. Um, at Minted, we are continuing to add more and more product. And in parallel to that, we are working more and more on understanding our customer, figuring out better and better and more effective ways of um, a more efficient discovery process um, on the site. Whether that's self-led by the customer indicating what they're interested in or us just knowing whether it's from you know, where they're logged in um, as a, a beginning indicator of what they might be interested in to the time of year. Um, you know, we know that folks get engaged around the holidays. They're looking for save the dates in January and February um, and in for invitations a few months later for all of the spring and summer and fall weddings. Um, we know that folks who come to the site in mid-November are probably looking for holiday cards. Um, and so, um, and then we can tell within one or two clicks whether we got that right or wrong and adjust their experience. Strikes me you've got two customers. You've got the one that buys the finished product, but actually you also need to find that talent pool. How do you go and find the artists to take part in that, that challenge and get involved in the, in the platform? You know, that's a, that's a really good question. We have a full artist relations team at Minted who is entirely focused on um, uh, finding new artists, developing relationships with existing artists. We actually have a loyalty program-ish um, um, for our artists. It, it's actually, I, and I say ish, not the program part. It's actually highly developed, highly structured, um, but it isn't, I wouldn't really call it a loyalty program. Um, but it is a program for engagement with our artist community um, that helps deepen our relationship with them, helps make sure we understand what they need from us and how we can deliver it. We've only got a few minutes left. Has anyone got any more questions? We've, we've got a, a microphone 
coming your way. If you could just hold your hand up, please, and... Uh, Hey Sarah, um, thanks for your insight. I had a question in relation to um, putting in processes. What three things, if you had to start from scratch as a brand, what three processes would you put in place to ensure that the customer journey is at its ultimate? Um, I think... What th three things do I put in place? So number one, hyper-focus on putting in place a, a structure to really get to know customers and their life cycle and they're with us. Um, we like to be with our customers during all of their um, milestone moments in their life, their wedding, the birth of a child for birth announcements. Um, party invitations, personalized stationery, holiday cards where they're connecting with their loved ones. So we'd like to be a part of all of the celebrations. So really knowing our customer is a very important, would be a very, is a very important aspect of what we do. So I think making sure that that foundation is solid. Um, the other one is, I think another thing that we spend a lot of time focused on is um, the experience of the customer before they place their order so for us, we're not selling widgets, right? It's not about the discovery of, I'm looking for a red t-shirt, which red t-shirt do I wanna buy? Here are the 10 options. These five are in my size, I like this one the best, I'll buy this, click and order. It's much more of a, um, of a, a process. We have a fairly long time between when someone come, first comes to the website and when they actually place their order. And um, it can be a challenge, it can be overwhelming. So really being laser focused on the customer purchasing journey um, is, is critical. Um, so could I just interject uh, on that one as well? And it's yeah. what, not what you think the customer is, but what the customer is actually doing. Because we, we, we can sit in a bubble and think this is how I would do it, but actually I'm not the customer. Yeah, exactly. And I do think that that is a place where I'm seeing a lot of AI come to bear. Um, th there are a number of companies um, uh, that are helping, leveraging AI to help with um, customer discovery. So um, FindMine is a company in the apparel business, um, and they actually, instead of having your merchants put together the outfits, FindMine will actually use the images to understand which products can be put together. And it, so they're not even using like, what did other customers buy together? Um, they're creating a curated set, again, leveraging AI to do that. Um, Constructor is also um, a company that is leveraging AI. Um, so for example, if you are on an enterprise site that sells everything, right, and you search for chips, if you have food in your shopping cart, they'll give you potato chips, crisps, you know, snack food. If you have um, seeds in your shopping cart, it will produce results for wood chips. So really understanding the motiva understanding what customers are looking for. Um, and then there's um, an another one um, whose name is, is escaping me. Um, if, if I was in San Francisco, I'd still remember it um, because I'm, I'm tired, it's two in the morning or whatever, um, that within three clicks can um, understand whether a customer is h highly likely to buy, in which case you don't need a, a um, discount or any sort of motivation or offer to get them to buy, or is not likely to buy no matter what, in which case you might want to try a little discount just to see if you could ooch them along. But from a, a brand perspective, you also may not want to give them a discount so that you're not being seen as, as um, discounting? Or is this somebody who like could buy, but they need a little encouragement, and so you focus your, um, your marketing, um, your discount dollars on that person to get them over the hump to then have a great experience with your brand? Um, so there's a lot of technology that's happening to 
help support the discovery process. So that, the, the third point the guy was, uh, the gentleman was after then was probably understanding your customer yeah. and putting in place the right processes to enable you to sell to them in the right way. Mm -hmm. And that, it, it, over the years we've talked about cross-selling and upselling, and it's knowing where to do that. And it's the same with discounting. You know, are they just going to be a price orientated customer and therefore is it worth having them? Yeah, I heard a great example um, once, which was um, if any of you are ride bicycles, um, my husband is a big mountain biker and road biker. And um, they said, look, you, your tires pop every once in a while. So you always want to have one spare, but they don't pop every day. So you really don't need more than one spare. So there's relatively little discount that when my husband has one or two spare tires in already, even 50% off, 70%, he doesn't need another spare. Um, however, when he's down to no spares and he wants to go out, he'll spend any amount of money because he, he, wants, needs, to he, he wants to go out. So um, a lot of it is truly just knowing timing, knowing the customer, knowing the customer motivation, and making sure that you're engaging with them and giving them either the information, the discount, the timing that, that, that they need. And I guess one of the challenges is if it's the first time I visited, how do you know what my motivations are? So is that where you can, we come back to that product discovery and that curation again? Yeah, and I mean, and the changes in data privacy laws have had a huge impact on that, right? Where now the, the value of first party data is incredibly powerful, which is why loyalty programs are so important because it gives the customer an incentive and a reason to identify themselves, regardless of whether they're on their phone or at their work computer or their home computer, not that anyone shops from the office, but um, you know, whichever device they're on, it gives them a reason to identify themselves, which then helps you build up over time more and more of that first party data that's connected. The other thing that I would say on data is, um, although this is your area of expertise, so tell me if Sorry. I'm completely <laughs> off base here, is um, I think that apps are incredibly powerful. I've always believed that apps were powerful. Now that um, apps create a reason to, for like real estate on the home screen, um, I mean, how many times do you go into your browser on your phone and type in a URL? Um, it's not nearly as often as you just tap Plus, the data that you get, because it's, it's um, connected with a device and an account, is much cleaner. Um, it's another opportunity to market much more effectively and to give a much um, more personalized experience. And yes, with my DPO hat on, I think that's one of the values in actually having, if we do it right, you can collect the right data in the right way, mm -hmm. and it's far more valuable than having a much bigger bucket of rubbish. That's exactly right, yeah. And actually, you can drive better customer engagements with that as well. Yeah. So. Excellent. Any final questions before we finish? Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Right down at the front. <laughs> Thank you. We talked about profitability before. How much of your marketing budget goes for branding versus direct response? Um, ooh. Sorry. You're asking me about marketing attribution, which is like a two-hour session. <laughs> I mean, I, we, this is a non-answer, but we really do think about it holistically. I mean, you must think about the full funnel. And, you know, only having branded search isn't going to get you what you need, even though that has the highest ROAS because a customer is much more um, qualified. If you don't have anything around awareness um, or top of the funnel, you're not going to feed that bottom of the funnel. Um, and then I think um, the other thing that I, I think a, a number, enough companies don't really think about is the, that customer experience and the um, you know, just how important it is to marketing to have a really good product. Another aspect of um, what Minted does, and it's very obvious to us, but I think it actually applies to more companies than you might initially imagine, is what we call virality. Um, so fundamentally, our products are 
then mailed out to our customers. For the most part, the artwork stays on their walls. But personalized stationery, invitations, save the dates, holiday cards are all mailed out, and they have our logo on the back. And so a very high quality product, then you know you get you receive my holiday card and you turn it over and you're like, wow, this is a great holiday card. It's you know, feels wonderful, it looks great, and oh, it's by minted, maybe I should get my holiday cards from minted. So again, like it, it again, you know, to a hammer everything's a nail. I'm a chief operating officer, so I think it's very important. Um, but I, I again it's it's it it has to be a full funnel, holistic view of the customer, their life cycle with you, and not to underestimate the power of the quality of your product. Personally, I find it refreshing that the operational side is talking so passionately about the quality of the product and the customer experience. So I certainly wouldn't knock that approach whatsoever. I think it'd be, there's, there's lots of conference lots of the sessions that we talk about over the next two days where actually these silos are one yeah. of the issues that we have. Yeah, I mean, if anyone was in my session this morning, you're gonna, you will have already heard this, but you know, I think I always go to shows and I like to sort of come home with like, what are two or three things that I'm gonna actually do, right? And what I encouraged everyone there, it was a session on marketing, and I said, if you're a marketer, go make a date for tea or coffee or lunch with your operations partner. Um, and build a relationship with them because they will enable so much. And the example that I gave was we were sitting in a holiday preparation meeting and um, one of my marketing partners said, oh, we used to do this, um, this wonderful campaign. It was incredibly powerful, but we can't do it anymore and sort of moved on. And I said, well, wait, like, we'll, we'll take this offline. I don't want to interrupt you, but you know, let's ask the question, why can't you do this? And what's stopping us? And we're now working on a, putting in place a plan to enable operationally this marketing campaign that was incredibly powerful and we had to stop a couple of years ago. So you know, just building those bridges and those relationships and understanding how it's all interconnected is, um, is very powerful. So we've got just under three minutes left. What's next for Minted? Oh, the sky's the limit. Um, we, I think the, the next biggest thing that we are working on is we've launched um, a marketplace so our artists can sell direct their one-of-a-kind pieces of artwork. Um, and we've also launched a marketplace to help with, um, in particular, our wedding business to make some of the products that we don't make um, but which brides want. So when I think about marketplaces, I think about you know, what's the benefit to the consumer? And um, obviously one benefit to the consumer is convenience. You can get everything you need with one in one shopping cart. We're, so we're looking to do um, more of that for our um, customers who are getting married. And then the second thing is we can, um, marketplaces are an incredible opportunity for sellers who sell smaller, niche products um, to have a much wider audience that they could never achieve by having their own shop and trying to market their own shop individually. But by being on a platform like Minted, we are able to give um, artists who have a very specific style, they can now reach customers who appreciate that style. Is there a danger that you actually get the, the quality that you've been talking about? Is there a danger that that might dilute that, that quality? Um, there is, except we're absolutely laser focused on it. I mean, when you, when you have marketplaces, right, you've got the three styles of marketplaces. You have open marketplaces, managed marketplaces, and then you have highly curated and embedded marketplaces. We are absolutely on that end. Um, we, we generally tend to invite rather than have applications for folks to sell on our marketplace. Um, and so we absolutely are aware that our brand, Minted, stands for something. Um, and we want it to stand for something to our artists as well as our customers. Excellent. Well, on that note, I can only thank you for standing in in such short notice. And sitting here and talking to me it's for a pleasure 45 to be minutes. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Something that you weren't expecting to be doing. So <laughs> thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you You're all for welcome. your time. Thank you.